Good morning and thank you for joining today's webinar. This is Tom Bankey with Forward Community Investments and we're excited to have you join us for today's presentation. This presentation represents the second installment of our monthly webinar series on racial equity. Before we get going, I'd like to take this opportunity to share some background and how we got here today. Forward Community Investments has been serving the state of Wisconsin for over 20 years. FCI transforms Wisconsin communities by supporting organizations and programs that reduce racial, social, and economic disparities. Community, partnership, inclusion, and equity, these four words represent what we value most here at FCI. In 2013, we sought feedback from nonprofits, investors, businesses, foundations, community lenders, and citizen activists around the state to better understand the critical issues communities are facing and learn about how we can work together to create a brighter future for Wisconsin. Last year, our board approved an updated vision and mission that reflect what we heard from these partners. And we make it a, our explicit commitment to transforming Wisconsin by making communities fairer and more just. Our mission is to be an investor, connector, and advisor for organizations and initiatives that reduce social, racial, and economic disparities in Wisconsin communities. Our vision is an equitable and inclusive Wisconsin that is built upon cooperative social action. With the help of BMO Harris Bank, we are able to offer this series of webinars to provide partners with tools and approaches that can be used, in advance, used to advance social, racial, and economic equity and inclusion within their work at no cost to you. BMO Harris Bank is an active partner in Wisconsin communities and demonstrates strong corporate citizenship as an important part of whom they are and how they approach community. Volunteerism and corporate responsibility are a key part of the culture at BMO Harris Bank. It's how they demonstrate their commitment to and invest in the communities they serve. Right now, I'd like to go through a few housekeeping slides. You can join the webinar by using the telephone number provided in your confirmation email that was sent to you directly from GoToWebinar. Or you can use your computer speakers, which is re recommended by GoToWebinar. We want this webinar to be as an interactive as possible, and we'll be taking questions throughout the webinar. Uh, you can submit them using the chat or questions box on the right-hand side of your screen. Now, we would like to, for everyone to participate in the first poll of the webinar, and that will be asking, um, what is your role in your organization? So it looks like we've got some folks uh, coming in, uh, look about 87% staff, 5% funder, 10% uh, other. So we'll give you a couple more minutes, or a couple more seconds, excuse me. Great. Thank you so much for uh, responding to that poll. It is greatly appreciated. And then using the chat feature on the right-hand side of the screen, please enter your name and organization. Great. Thank you so much for everybody. Hopefully this will enhance our today's presentation and increase the interactivity between uh, the audience and uh, us here uh, doing the present presenting. Um, now that we've got those tasks out of the way, let's get to know our speaker. At this time of the year, we want to bring a speaker that would help us all get into the reflection and sharing mode, so we're pleased to be able to bring you Lauda Monero, a gifted storyteller. Lauda's presentation is entitled, Working Together to Ach um, is uh, something different, but we'll get to that. Lauda Patricia Monero is currently a PhD student in the Counseling Psychology Department at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She received her bachelor's degree in psychology with a minor in sociology from California State University Fullerton, where she also went on to receive her master's degree in psychology. 
Originally from Mexico, Lauda was raised in a small rural town in the farming capital of California and is passionate about working with marginalized communities who may experience discrimination and oppression resulting in high levels of minority stress. Lauda's research interests include examining how policy impacts the lived experiences of immigrants and LGBTQ communities in hopes of being able to identify how to better serve these populations through more inclusive implementation of policy and distribution of services. As a future counseling psychologist, Lauda not only aspires to become a tenured psychology professor, but also seeks to own a nonprofit organization for both the Latino immigrant and LGBT community in hopes of providing mental health services to those who may not otherwise be able to address those services, access those services, excuse me. During this webinar, Lauda will explore the following topics. How can we find commonality with one another in our fight towards achieving racial equity? What is storytelling and what role can it play in increasing our understanding about ourselves, others, and racial equity? And lastly, how can we integrate storytelling and meaning making into our work? So with those out of the way, I'd like to turn it over to Lauda and uh, we will get going. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Tom, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you again, Forward Community Investments, for having me. Thank you for all those that are joining us today. And I look forward to interacting with you all as I go through this presentation. Um, and again, today I'll be talking about working together to achieve racial equity and how we can use storytelling and meaning making. Um, in order to achieve this. So feel free again to ask questions throughout the presentation. Um, I will be trying to address some of them. I'm sorry if I don't get to all of them, um, but I do have some questions for you all, so I'm really hopeful that you can engage in actually participating in the polls. Um, so I know Tom did address the purpose and goals, um, and that is again to address what is storytelling, um, what, are, what role can storytelling play in increasing our understanding about ourselves and others and racial equity? And uh, how can we integrate storytelling and meaning making into our work? So we'll go ahead and continue and get started. Are we okay to go? I believe we are. Okay. All right. So. We'll go ahead and start with, so what is storytelling? So throughout life, individuals experience a wide array of averse and meaningful events that play an integral role in shaping one's identity and sense of self. So one of the major characteristics of well-formed life stories is a sense of meaning or integration of one's experiences and of oneself in the present time. So how do you think about the experiences and events that have occurred in your life and what meaning do you attach to them? So in particular, storytelling is one form of meaning making that individuals integrate to get, gain a sense of deeper understanding of their own identity development. And we have seen a lot of research come out about the impact that being able to tell your story and develop your story has on identity development. Developing narratives and storytelling, I believe, has the innate power that can help guide us and influence us in the work that we do. So we do need to acknowledge how storytelling does have the danger of supporting an individualistic and relativism that ignores differences in power and privilege. Um, this is something that we have seen throughout history. So not all stories are treated equally oftentimes because some stories are supported and reinforced by the power structure, while others might 
might need to fight tenaciously in order to be heard. And that's something that we do need to keep in mind as we think about how do we integrate this into our work. Are we sharing a, a, a fair space for everybody to be able to um, be able to engage in one, with one another and listen to each other's stories and propel our stories forward in an equal manner. So sharing of individual stories and group experiences with racism and other experiences of marginalization and oppression can be an empowering experience that can aid us in finding commonality with one another. So now here's one of our first polling questions. So one of my questions for you is how do you use storytelling in your personal life? Okay, so we're seeing some votes coming in. We'll wait for a little more. So we're, right now we're at 95% indicating yes, that yes, you use storytelling in your personal life. And 5% of you are indicating no, you don't use storytelling in your personal lives. All right, so this is our next question, and this might seem a little different for you. How many of you actually use storytelling in your work? Um, and when I ask that, think about how commonly you use it, right? So not just that you used it once, so think about on a day-to-day -day work day, how often do you use storytelling in your work? great. So we are seeing a bit of a difference in comparison to how often people are using storytelling in their personal lives versus how often you use it in your work lives. So 77% of people indicated that they use it in their work life and previously it was about 95% of individuals who said that they use it in their personal lives. So it's good for us to think about that um, and how we do this, right? So again, how can we use storytelling to increase our understanding of ourselves? Um, so this is a, a big question because we can't take ourselves out of the equation, right, when we're talking about storytelling. So storytelling does help us um, introspect and do some deep digging. So oftentimes maybe we don't sit down and think about, you know, where do we come from? How did we get to where we are? What events and experiences have we had in our lives that influence our feelings and emotions and how these contribute to our present sense of self? So if, we play, if we're able to pay closer attention to this, um, we can start to recognize how our identities are indeed multi-layered and how they may intersect or they may even parallel other aspects of our identity. So this is something that I think is really, really important for us to highlight because oftentimes when we talk about racial equity, we can't ignore that there are other identities that also influence our experiences. And again, how we perceive our present sense of self. So something else, again, going back to the other slide where I indicated how some stories um, are not supported by certain power structures, it is important as we share our stories to be able to acknowledge the privilege that arises within our stories. And it can be hard to think about that, right? Um, in what ways or what kind of privileges in our lives have we had that have helped us get to where we are today? Um, it's important to be able to reflect on this experience because it uh, does influence the work that we do. Um, so reflecting on how different events and experiences in our life influence our thinking, our knowledge, and way of engaging with others in the world. So as you think about that, we're coming up on another poll question here. So what privileged identity do you feel is most helpful to you in the work that you do? So we have gender, race, socioeconomic status, educational level, other. 
Awesome. I'm seeing all the numbers coming in. This is really exciting for me to get to see this. So, so far with people who have voted, and I'll, I'll wait a little bit longer and see if they change, but so far we see 52% indicating that educational level is the most privileged identity that helps them in their work. We see 24% indicating socioeconomic status. We see 14% indicating race. 5% indicating gender, and 5% indicating other. And these results are, are really unique, right? Because maybe we're thinking about uh, one specific work setting, right? So I'd like you to think about this question, because I guess for me, when I think about maybe if I ever do engage in lobbying, which I have in the past, my educational level might help me more um, than let's say if I were to go to a Latino community festival for some reason and I wanted to talk to individuals there um, and a language could be a privilege for me because I also speak Spanish, right? So again, thinking about different aspects of your identity and how it might actually shift depending on what you're actually doing and what environment you find yourself in and who you're actually interacting with. So it's always important to think about um, not viewing our work um, just as unidimensional, um, but that is also possible. So with that, how do we increase our understanding of others? Once again, through storytelling. Um, it's a scary thing, right? Sometimes to be able to share personal things about yourself with other people. And one of the main things that needs to be established is that there needs to be trust in the relationship. Um, and that can be hard. Maybe um, if you've met people for the first time or you're at a retreat or you're with a group of people that you don't know so well. Um, and we see this often happen when you're entering a new um, setting or a new job or maybe you're going to a conference. Um, confidentiality needs to be maintained. So that is one of the initial steps in helping us increase our understanding of others is being able to provide them with that trust. When you're listening to other people's stories, it's important to listen with curiosity and a willingness to be flexible and learn. One needs to be respectful and acknowledge the privilege that you have to hear other stories. Whenever I've done workshops like this um, at conferences, I oftentimes have the experience of hearing people say, you know, I've never thought about this. In fact, I've actually never shared this with anybody. And it's important for us to acknowledge the privilege that comes with that, to be able to be let into somebody's life in such a personal way um, and to be a part of, of that story with them. So it's important to pay attention to what aspects of their story make you feel understanding and em empathetic to their experiences and overall how this increase you feeling closer to them. Once again, I've done this workshop before in person, and I have literally had people saying after they've shared their stories throughout the workshop, people leave saying, you know, give me your number. I feel like we're best friends. We're soul sisters. We're soul brothers. I wish I had met you sooner. So it really does have an impact, and what helps that is to figure out how you're understanding this individual, how you're empathizing with this individual and why you are actually connecting with them by hearing their story. Um, so take care of yourself as well though. Um, it could be triggering sometimes to hear other people's experiences because maybe you've had a similar experience or maybe you've had another experience and it's important to pay attention to your mind, your body, and your emotions as you listen to another person's story and figuring out once again being introspective about that and figuring out where this is actually coming from for you. Um, is it coming from a past experience you've had? Is this a new feeling for you? And why do you think that might be? And once again, taking care of yourself. I know it's a little different now because we're not in person, but when you do find yourself in the space of sharing stories with people, are you able to respectfully remove yourself um, versus becoming reactive to somebody's story? Um, also, some people might actually want you to respond, right? And so thinking about speaking from the heart whenever you respond to somebody's story versus, once again, becoming reactive, um, because that, that can happen. And one of the big questions, one of the 
big reasons why Tom and Forward Community Investments asked me to kind of talk about storytelling is how does this increase our understanding of racial equity? So I know we had Angela do a webinar was it like last month or yeah um, and it was really a great and I found like a lot of the research that she was uh, presenting and a lot of the findings that she presented were really in line with some of the um, components that I'm presenting here so research has indicated that individuals may be unwilling to express negative racial attitudes due to perceived social pressures to be non-prejudiced um, and that's a very real thing you know nobody wants to be perceived as racist or having biases or having prejudices. But the reality in our world is that we all do. We all have biases. And again, these are informed by our own life experiences and the exposure that we've had, um, some systemic um, pressure as well. So it's important to think about that um, as you tell your story. Research on aversive racism indicates that although we are likely to negate having any discriminatory attitudes towards others, we tend to look for variables or experiences that do justify our attitudes. And so once again, it's important to think about how that's coming up in our stories um, and how we can be more reflective and think about um, what are the experiences that influence me to have these sorts of feelings. And it's really about trying to bring these things to the conscious mind. Um, so research indicates that having closer proximity to people who are from diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds helps reduce our tendency to other people who don't look or act like us. Um, and this is huge, right? This is where storytelling comes in. Um, research has proven this for a really long time. So how are we going to use these findings to be able to increase commonality between one another? Um, again, when we don't have a personal experience with someone who is different than us or we've never um, had close interactions with them, it's, it's a lot harder to engage with them in a way that is respectful, that is understanding, that is empathic um, versus people that we are really familiar with, right? So again, the goal of storytelling is to increase that familiarity with people and that sense of closeness, that sense of understanding and that empathy. So continuing along those lines, how can we find commonality with one another in our fight towards achieving racial equity? So using storytelling, we're able to empathize with others' human experience. So we're able to operate in a way that we're kind of reducing some of the assumptions that we make. Um, so as humans, we are complex in the way that our identities intersect, influence, and inform how we feel about ourselves, others, and our work. So it provides us with the opportunity to get to know one another beyond what we see, what we are commonly to know about someone and what we assume. So it's, it's sometimes hard for people to kind of admit that we all make assumptions. Once again, maybe this isn't such a conscious process for some people, and it's really difficult to bring our assum assumptions and to admit them and to bring them to the conscious mind. Um, I know one activity I commonly done with students when I teach at UW um, is I give them the opportunity to submit anonymous assumptions about me based on not knowing anything about me other than I'm the instructor for the course. And I know one of the assumptions that has commonly come up is they'll say, well, we initially thought you were mean and we initially thought you might be cold. Um, and, and I'd be like, well, why, why is that? And they're like, you wear really dark clothing and um, I guess most people who wear dark clothing tend to be mean. And so that, you know, even something as easy as what you're wearing can, can trigger an assumption um, by somebody based on their past experiences, right? And I know that initially it's really hard to talk about the assumptions that we have and being able to be compassionate with ourselves and empathetic to ourselves about where these come from um, can help us more openly share with other people. Um, so it also helps us acknowledge the psychosocio-cultural implications for how a person got to be where they are now and how they are today versus attributing to personal choice. So oftentimes we can think, oh, a person is that way because they chose to be or that's their circumstance because they chose it to be that way. Um, and again, that's an assumption that we're making. 
So despite coming from different walks of life, storytelling can help us um, figure out how we all actually want the same thing, particularly in the work that we do. And I think Tom indicated there was a question, or was there anything? Um, let me just check here. No, I think we're good for right now, and I think we'll revisit that uh, in a second. Okay. So it is fair to say that storytelling um, can make people nervous. It's a very vulnerable thing to do. Um, to actually share your story and share personal things about your life and also the kind of sense that you make out of these experiences, um, it can be difficult to share. So one of the questions that I actually have for you all is what makes you most nervous about sharing your story? Okay, so we're seeing, a, I think, a larger variation in responses than our previous poll questions that we had. Um, and so we're seeing 5% indicating others might not understand, 14% indicating I might offend someone, 33% indicating others will judge me, 29% indicating becoming emotional and being vulnerable, and 19% indicating I'm relatively comfortable sharing my story. Okay, so as you're seeing, right, for different people, um, different things come up when sharing their story. So it's important, again, to be mindful of that, right, and how we discuss why it's important to maintain confidentiality for these very reasons and to provide people with a safe space um, and to be um, open-minded when you're listening to people's stories. Um, so one thing that I thought would be unique for me to do is to maybe model a little bit um, what that looks like. So we'll get into that shortly. But before I do that, I did want to ask how you feel about this. Do you feel like you've ever had the opportunity to share your story in an open, um, non-judgmental environment? Okay. All right, I'm, wa I'm waiting for the responses to come in. This is great, I'm so happy you all are participating. All right, so right now we're seeing 70% indicating yes, you felt like you've had this opportunity. And 15% indicating no, and the other 15% indicating I'm unsure. Um, and, and that's, that's okay, right? So I think hopefully this presentation can help you figure out, right, like was it a safe environment for me? When is a safe environment for me to share these stories? And how, as organizations or in your work, can we provide others with a safe space to be able to do that? Um, but I see 75%, 70% uh, of you said that, yes, um, that's been the case. So we hope to see this change, at least at your organizations or in the work that you do, that maybe we could have um, more people feeling that way. So like I indicated, I thought um, it would be a really good idea to share a little bit about uh, myself and do some storytelling for you. Um, and similar feelings come up for me. It is uh, really nerve wracking and it is scary to share really personal and intimate um, things about my own life despite doing this work. Um, and it's always a very vulnerable space. And I think this is pretty much the first time that I've ever shared my story without even knowing who's on the other side, who's, who's watching, um, who's attending, um, and it's going to be harder to figure out how people feel or how people may or may not be impacted by my story because I don't have that one-on-one -on -one interaction. But commonly when I do this in person, um, I talk about and guide people through picking 
around five events or five time periods in people's lives um, that they find have been really impactful for them and have really shaped who they are, have led them to where they are now, and gives them a sense of identity. Um, and it's just a part of how they've developed. So for me, my story really starts before I was actually even born. Um, so I was born in 1990, um, and before I was born, um, my biological mother actually um, was pregnant with me, and my biological father um, indicated that he didn't want to have a girl and no longer wanted to have a relationship with my biological mother. Um, and so he left, and my biological mother couldn't raise me anymore. Um, and you'll see these two people on the side here um, in the PowerPoint. So you'll actually see um, this is my mom and my dad. Um, they adopted me pretty much right when I was born. And um, if you look at the lineage in our family, my dad would actually be my uncle today. Um, but I actually don't see it that way. For me, my parents are my sole parents. And they've given me so much in my life. Um, and I always feel like I was... I was pretty much meant to be with them. My parents um, did not have the ability to have children. Um, and I know that was a really difficult thing for them. Um, but this was an opportunity for them to, to um, raise me and to have a child and um, to have a family. And ever since then, pretty much from the day that I was born, I've, I've been with my parents. Um, and you'll see some pictures here of me Growing up, um, I did say I was born in Mexico, so a lot of these pictures were taken in Mexico, and you'll see some of my family here. And so in 1995, I start to um, talk about my immigration story. Um, and for me, uh, this is really one of the, probably one of the um, things that changed my life the most um, since I was born. And that's because my dad had actually already came to the United States, um, and it was really rough for us. Um, we were poor. Um, we did live in one house with about three other families, and we all shared this one home. Um, and for my dad, he really saw himself as responsible for um, getting us ahead and um, being able to provide us with a better future. And he came over. There were family that we had here already, so. We had an aunt here, and he was working, and my mom and I were by ourselves in Mexico, and it was actually, I do remember, I remember songs that I used to hear, and that would just make my mom and I cry because we really missed my dad, um, and it was really hard for us to be by ourselves, um, but, you know, we, we kind of made the decision that we were going to come to the United States, and um, unfortunately, that meant coming undocumented. Um, we were poor, so there was no way that we would qualify or apply for a visa. Um, there was no one who could apply to kind of sponsor us for residency. And this was pretty much the only choice that my parents were able to make. Um, and my mom and I really wanted to be reunited with my dad. And so um, that's kind of what happened for us. And I still remember we actually left um, after celebrating Christmas Eve um, with my family back home one last time, my mom and I celebrated. Um, and you'll see pictures of here of me in Mexico before I actually um, left. And so some of the family that you're seeing in these pictures, um, you'll see some of my, me celebrating my birthday with some of my cousins on the right. Um, you'll see me with a teacher when I was actually in preschool, so I was about four years old there. Um, you'll see these pictures, and you'll be seeing that some of these people I actually never got to see again. And, and uh, the immigration story, right, doesn't end upon leaving. It's almost just like a start, right? So here are the pictures that... You're seeing, um, if I can point them out, if you can see my mouse, um, these right here are actually um, some pictures from kindergarten when I first got to the United States and also from first grade. You see one from second grade over here. But I put this picture here 
these these two pictures here at the bottom you see my my mom and dad and I and then you see other families some of these family once again I I had to say goodbye to them um, forever um, and I hadn't mentioned this earlier but this is actually my biological stepsister um, and I actually didn't learn that she was my stepsister until after I immigrated so I remember that having a really large impact on me, um, losing the initial connection with her, but then to find out that she had actually been my stepsister um, after I had moved um, was really, really impactful for me. Um, and you see, you know, I'm starting to learn the language, starting to um, learn English for the first time, and I do remember the first word that I ever learned was actually the word cookie. <laughs> I remember that was the, like the only um, word that my dad had learned at the time, and so that was the first word that my dad taught me. Um, and it was a struggle. We we lived in a, again with another family. I was so grateful for my aunt and um, my uncle. Um, welcoming us into their home and we pretty much lived in one bedroom for about a year before um, my parents kind of um, you know started to become more settled and we became more settled as a family um, and started moving kind of into our own homes so this is a bit of a lot of fast forwarding so it'll be 2014 now and I talk a little bit more about the intersection of my identity um, because this is truly when um, I was around the age of 14. There you see my quinceanera picture, so you know that's 15 years old. Um, but I started to realize that for me, I didn't feel like um, I had the same attractions towards other people around me that uh, maybe my classmates had. And I actually remember being teased a lot growing up and not understanding why. Um, I remember classmates often calling me a dyke and um, laughing at me and making a lot of jokes. Um, and when I actually didn't even understand myself and what was going on, um, how this could impact me, um, it was really hard. So going through bullying, I remember spending lunches by myself, um, just being really isolated as I was growing up. and. Um, just feeling like, is, an, is there anyone out there who understands this experience? Um, growing up, I knew I was undocumented, so I thought about those things too, but that was something I didn't talk to anybody about, um, despite remembering, like, you know, the process, despite remembering the van that I came in, the, the family that I came in with. Um, I remember all of those things, but I never talked to any anyone about it. And so I speak of intersection here. Um, because I feel like it was a lot for me as a 14-year-old to, to think about how these experiences um, were impacting me or influencing me. Um, and again, I spoke about isolation and um, just feeling like I was the only one in that time. Um, and it was really, really difficult um, to think about those things at that age. And I imagine at any age, really. So here you see a picture of me um, from when I was in Mexico. I, I was honored to actually carry um, the Mexican flag for having good grades in preschool, um, having good attendance, having good behavior, and that, that was kind of an honor um, to get to do that for the school. Um, and I label this as um, college dreams because, you know, I, I think for me, being a first-generation college student, that... I feel like it was the norm to go to college and that's what I learned about the United States and, and that's what people did in the United States. But I truthfully, honestly, didn't didn't understand it. I remember looking as far as sixth grade and being like, okay, how do people know, you know, how do people know where they want to go? How do people know um, that this is what they want to do for their lives? And I really didn't start to think about it uh, for myself, honestly. Um, till I was close to graduating. But again, this was a difficult experience for me because um, I had been in honors classes, I had been in AP classes, I did everything that they were telling me would help me get into college. Um, I had really good grades, I graduated top 10% of my class, I applied to colleges, um, some of the top universities in California, um, and luckily got some acceptance letters. and. I found out pretty quickly that I was not going to be able to attend. 
Um, and that had been really hard for me because I, I didn't have the money. Again, I was first generation. Um, my parents and I really didn't know the concept of college and, you know, um, I was not going to qualify for any financial aid. Not having a social security number, I wasn't able to apply for any FAFSA. The scholarships that were available were limited. At that time, it was hard to get any full ride scholarships. I know that those exist now, um, which is wonderful. But for me, those things didn't really exist. Um, but I did get lucky, and I got to go to community college nearby um, on a full ride scholarship. Um, and again, the this, this story kind of continues there because I remember being in college and saying to myself, like, wow, I, I went through school. I thought I did everything right. Um, I was trying my best. I, you know, was right up there with my, my classmates and they all went to schools like UCLA and UC Berkeley and everyone left. All my close friends left and I was pretty much the only one kind of left behind in, in my small town and in, in my small community. And I remember I went through a depression. Um, again, those thoughts of feeling like I was by myself, like this wasn't anyone's experience. Um, why, why did I have to go through this? Um, was I not good enough? Um, and knowing that this was coming um, from systemic oppression, but at the time not really understanding that this was impacting more people than myself. And so when I, I did end up transferring to Cal State Fullerton, my, my parents were able to help me um, save up some money and I got a few scholarships. I, I started working, um, yes, um, I started working and a lot started to change for me. I started to meet other students who were also undocumented and I started to realize, wow, this is not just my narrative, this is other people's story as well. There are other students who have seen their parents struggle, who have seen them work full time, um, who have seen them um, fearful of driving, who have seen them fearful of going to work, who have seen them fearful of taking their kids to school. Um, and now I'm, I'm among this group of people and I remember things just really taking off for me and really being inspired by my classmates and my peers to become more of a leader. Um, and to be able to share what these experiences are like. And so here you're seeing me um, graduate. The times that I graduated with my bachelor's um, was in 2012, and you see the picture. My parents high-fiving each other. I, I got to be the graduation speaker, again, um, graduating top in my class at in college and just thinking before how I would cry about, you know, I don't, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to go to college. Um, but I was able to do that, again, with the help of my, my parents, with the help of um, my classmates, with the help of mentors. Um, and I also met my partner, who you'll see here on the left, and we got the opportunity to meet Dolores Huerta um, during my master's graduation. And I remember her always being a really big leader in the community, and she always thinks about where we're from. Um, and to never forget that and to always kind of carry um, that with us as we think about how do we give back to communities and how do we give back to other people, um, despite um, where we might be now. So just thinking about the story, I'm curious how um, you all experienced this. So what emotions did you experience maybe while I was sharing some of my story? Okay. Awesome. I'm seeing these coming in, and I'm I'm seeing uh, so the emotions I had pointed out were sadness, anger, happiness, empathy, all of the above, other, um, and mainly we're seeing five percent said sadness, um, twenty six percent said empathy. 68% um, said all of the above, and I can't see if there are any others, so it doesn't look like it. Um, but 
I know we don't have the opportunity to kind of discuss and talk about that more, but just think about those those emotions and those feelings as they come up. And thank you again for listening to my story. Um, I want to be able to tell you why it's important to think about emotions when you are sharing. Um, so here is kind of a diagram that shows some of the areas in our body that are activated. So as you think about whether you felt sad, whether you felt angry, um, when you felt happy, think about how these responses actually might have manifested in your body. Um, it's really important to think about this because this, knowing how this occurs for us and knowing how this manifests for us and what it might look like and what it might feel like, um, it will allow for you to be able to empathize for, with someone else who's also experiencing these same emotions. You might more easily be able to pick up on, okay, um, I'm seeing that person's face get flushed. Uh, maybe they're feeling some shame, right? Um, so being able to think about that or embarrassment um, will help you be able to empathize and relate to other people's stories. Um, so what other role do emotions play um, when one is sharing a story um, or when one is actually listening to a story. So sometimes when you experience distress while listening to somebody's story, there is a release of cortisol that um, is released in the brain and this chemical has been found to actually increase a person's ability to remember um, something or remember an event. Um, while also experiencing emotions through storytelling releases oxytocin and we see that oxytocin is really uh, released um, and creates feelings of care and empathy um, and having both of these um, experiences while listening to someone's story helps you empathize with them and feel more closer to them. Um, so again, it's important to think about how emotions are also related, related to biological um, responses in our bodies that actually will help increase commonality between one another and, and a better understanding of where that person's coming from. All right. Okay. So I know we do have one question. I know we're getting towards the end of this. Um, so I did want to say, how is storytelling relevant to your work? Um, so I'm sure many of you are leaders um, in your communities. And so storytelling is a practice of leadership. And remembering that each of us actually does have a story, a compelling story to tell. Um, leaders employ both the head and the heart in order to be able to mobilize others um, and act effectively. Um, so the key to storytelling is um, that understanding increases the ability to inspire action through emotion. And this is a way for you to maybe think about it a little bit more in terms of how it, it comes into your work. So there are three types of stories that you can think about. So developing the story of self, which is what we spent most of our time talking about today. Um, and that's kind of your call to leadership. How did you get to where you are and want, wanting to work on racial equity or other social justice oriented issues? Um, the story of now, what, what is the strategy based on what you know, based on your experiences? And when you think about your organization as a whole, what is the story of us? Um, and the shared values and the shared experiences, experiences that you all have. And remember that these all work um, in a bi-directional um, way and they all work together to be able to allow for us to enact change and see change. So one of the final questions that I have for you is uh, which story have you had the least experience in developing? So there's the story of self, the story of us, um, the story of now, or you feel all of the above equally. Okay, nice. I'm actually surprised by these results and, and that's actually really neat to see. I'm seeing right now um, with the poll that 50% of individuals indicated that um, the story of us is the story most developed for you. 7% um, indicated the story of self um, and again, that's not to indicate that you haven't, right? I'm just asking um, which one is the most. Um, but 27% indicating story of now and 13% indicating all of the above equally. So this is great. 
I really like seeing this because it, it, it lets you know like you know what areas can you improve on how can you bring this to your work what areas should I be focusing on and seeing that story of self is the least developed um, and the least used I, I think for me makes sense because I think oftentimes when we work um, maybe we remove ourselves from sharing our stories to give other people space but um, it, it's actually one of the most important things for us to do um, so I just want to end with this and then answer a few questions. Um, so how is storytelling, once again, relevant to our work? So it reduces tension and insecurities around discussing race. Um, it, and it gives us the opportunity to acknowledge our implicit biases and bring them a little bit more to the conscious mind and figure out how those have influenced the ways that we act and behave around others and the way that we think um, and also the way that we provide services to others. Um, so it's important to practice bringing the unconscious to the conscious mind um, because it's only then that we can begin to re-narrate and start to write some counter stories. How do we begin to re-narrate and look at things differently? Um, and it also acknowledges how the messages we have internalized motivates our actions and behavior um, to be able to impact our thoughts and feelings that again lead to change in our work. Um, so I know that Angela last week kind of showed this. Um, so I want to leave you with that. I know there was a lot to cover, but um, I really think that this does um, talk about how we work together and how it's important to not other um, people for their experiences. So um, Lila Watson says, if you have come to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Um, and I think that's just exemplary of how um, storytelling can help us think about how we all have a role in working towards the same thing and how all of our stories um, are, are important and how we can um, help propel those in, our, in the work that we do. Okay, so I see a question that's here. Um, and just looking at the time, I. I think I clicked out of it, so sorry, we're looking for the question. Okay, so I have Tom help me out and scrolling through here. So um, this individual says, I'm a white person with high educational achievement. I work in an organization that assists low-wage workers in correcting violations of their workplace rights. Sometimes I have to tell people of different ethnic heritage, lower education, and lower socioeconomic status that there is unfortunately not a legal right that protects against the negative experiences that they had. It makes me feel like a part of the system that is oppressing them. And I sometimes sense that workers feel that way as well. Do you have advice about approaching these conversations on a level playing field? That is such a great question. And um, I think what you're pointing out is that these, these experiences are common for us, particularly as we're pointing out um, the privilege, right, that we have um, and how oftentimes we we also are powerless um, in some of these instances and in some of these situations and, and how um, we can't um, just kind of fix everything for people, right? And, and I, I don't know if it would helpful for you in thinking about storytelling. Um, I don't know if feelings of, of guilt come up for you at all about not being able to do anything or um, just wanting them to, to understand kind of what your experience is like and that um, you really wish that you could do something if you could. Um, I always feel like those conversations go a long way because they do give us a better understanding of um, where a person is coming from, right? And advocating for other people is part of our work. And sometimes we do find ourselves to be powerless. Um, I find this to be a common experience for me um, particularly here now that I'm uh, in the state of Wisconsin working with undocumented students who don't have access to college um, because there's no um, help. They actually have to pay out-of-state tuition despite um, living in the state. And um, 
they lived in the state all their lives, like 15, 18 years, and they're not able to go to college because it's they're actually being charged out-of-state tuition fees. And I know I feel the same kind of sense of powerless, so I know what you're talking about. Um, and I know that being able to find kind of common ground with them, being able to kind of sit with them in that experience, um, and it kind of, it's a vulnerable thing to do, right, to share. Um, maybe I don't understand what you're feeling right now, but I can sense how this can be frustrating or um, – I myself am actually frustrated with the fact that I, I can't do more at this moment. Um, and, you know, maybe taking some recommendations from people, I find that to be helpful and learning more about their experience because when we close ourselves to learning more of those experiences, it is difficult for us to start to change um, some of the social structures, right, that, that um, kind of make us a little bit powerless. Yeah. Okay, so I think we are pretty much on the dot. Um, we are out of time, but feel free um, if you have more questions. I, I know my email's on the presentation. If you access the presentation later on, you'll see that I know we didn't have um, too much time to talk, but there's actually some resources that I have here for you all. Um, there's a learning about race and racism through storytelling and the arts, um, and this is actually from individuals at Columbia University who put a whole curriculum together. So if you're in the area of teaching or you'd like to bring that to your organization, there's that. Um, there's actually a video about how storytelling changes behavior by changing our brain chemistry. Um, I include a story of digital, uh, an example of digital stories. So remember that there's more than one way to share your story, whether you do it verbally, whether you do it through pictures, whether you do it through art, whether you do it through videos. There's a lot of examples for you to use there. Um, and I also include a, an author who I think does this really well. She's actually a children's book author and illustrator. Yuyi Morales, and she has a blog, so that's another way to kind of share your story. But, um, right, I know people said, maybe I don't do this as much in my, um, in my work life. So, again, thinking about how you can bring that there. Um, and these are just questions that I put on there, how to effect effectively share your story. So, thinking about these things as you share your stories. Um, and if you ever do do a group activity to story tell, here are some questions that can help guide your conversation as you talk. Um, and here's my contact information if you did have more questions or if you wanted to get connected. Um, and I'll give it um, back to Tom to close this off. Thank you again, everyone, for participating. Please join me in thanking Laura for today's content and BMO Harris Bank for their support. The presentation they shared was so valuable that, as with all of our webinars, the recording will be made available for playback on our website. We will also be sending out a follow-up message to all attendees with links to more resources uh, from the presentation and the aforementioned link to the recording presentation. I would encourage all participants to review our website at forwardci.org for more information on how forward community investments might help your organization. Our next installment of our webinar series on racial equity will take place on Tuesday, January 12th with Laura Dresser and Erica Nelson. You can register for this webinar and find more information about it on our website. This information will also be included on the follow-up message. One last note. Please take a few minutes to complete to help us. Uh, excuse me. Please take a few minutes to complete um, the following survey that will pop up after you leave the webinar. And thanks again to BMO Harris Bank for making this exceptional learning opportunity available. We wish all of you a safe and ho uh, safe holiday season filled with lots of wonderful stories and a peaceful 2016. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care.